is always the case when you organise something. Uh, but just wanted to say, um, again, this is we're really, really pleased that you can join us uh, for the continued conference, which is part of the York Media Alley Festival. And just before I hand you over to Esther, I just wanted to remind you guys that there are some slots still available for the Creative Enterprise Workshops. Now, Catherine, who's over here, is just going to come up and tell you a little bit about herself because she's one of the mentors. So you can essentially have a one-to-one -one session with her for half an hour this afternoon, completely free, um, just over the road in the Yorkshire Museum. So she's got some slots free. She's just going to come and tell you a couple of, a couple of bits about herself. Hi, thanks for that. Hi, everybody. Um, basically, yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm on my tiptoes. Um, yeah, basically, my uh, fields of expertise are marketing, comms, social enterprise, and general business development. So the sessions that we had yesterday, the one-to-ones, were really great. Completely wide variety of people coming along with different challenges. Um, and one of the things I think they, that helped them with just that half an hour session was a chance to reflect on what they're trying to achieve for themselves going forward, um, personally as well as in the business world. So it's just a chance to kind of think about what you want to do, what you're trying to do, and give you some hints and tips on how you can manage yourself better and kind of work on yourself as a business rather than just working in the business, which most people do when they're starting up. So yeah, feel free to book a slot. Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, so did everybody have a, a fun morning? Yeah? Great. It was cool, wasn't it? Um, I um, got to um, 
have the experience in the caravan, which was great, and I got to do the Czech binaural sound experience, which I thought was really beautiful. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, it was great. Just great to kind of have all those um, new and unique experiences. So um, without further ado, it's, we've got a great afternoon. We've got some fantastic speakers, um, and the first of which is Ben from Invisible Flock. Um, and he's going to be talking about his game installation project. Um, Invisible Flock are an interactive studio based in Leeds. Um, and this piece of work that he's going to talk about is called If You Go Away. And it was produced in seven different galleries, art museums, um, and, um, and also was, was produced in the context of a film um, context as well. I think he'll explain, maybe elaborate on that. Um, and Primarily, it was an augmented reality experience that you discovered through your phone. So, I will allow Ben to tell you more about it. Okay. Hi. Is it right if I do this? Yeah, cool. <coughs> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ben, and I'm the technical director of a interactive art studio called Invisible Flock. Uh, we are based in Leeds, so not too far away. We're neighbours. And today, I'm going to talk to you guys about a project that we did about four or five years ago uh, called If You Go Away. So it's been quite an interesting experience reflecting back on it. Uh, but this isn't just one of those, like, look at how cool my project is kind of talks, because in many ways, this was an absolute nightmare and nearly broke me emotionally and physically and was, like, some of the darkest periods of my life. So we're going to, like, <laughs> explore that a little bit, and hopefully there is some teachable moments, uh, certainly for me, uh, if for no one else. Uh, and kind of, yeah, just sort of see, see what happens as trying to tell this story. Um, I'm supposed to talk for 45 minutes, which is a big old chunk of talking, so... Um, yeah, I probably won't, which means we can have a chat and have a conversation around it because hopefully it will raise some interesting stuff. So a little bit about us. Uh, this is us at our black and white moody best. Uh, so like I said, we're called Invisible Flock. Uh, there's three of us in the studio full time. Myself on the right, obviously. Uh, sitting above me is Victoria, who's our creative director, and Catherine, our creative producer. We are based in Leeds, so we have a studio and a workshop and we make these days sort of large-scale interactive and digital art that we're fortunate enough to kind of show all around the world. We don't work that much in Yorkshire, uh, and but also in a lot of context. We work a lot in galleries and cities and in public spaces, and our work is normally uh, quite physical in its presence. So we're currently over in Liverpool running this project, which is called Aurora, um, which is kind of like a big digital installation. We've reflooded an abandoned above ground Victorian reservoir um, full of water and we, well, we've made it full of water. It wasn't until we got there and we've hung loads of ice from the ceiling on winches and there's lasers and there's massive sound rig and it's kind of this big, l noisy, high impact work for a lot of people which is kind of like the diametric opposite, in a way, of the work I'm going to talk about today, which was uh, called If You Go Away. So If You Go Away, uh, for those of you who know your French folk, uh, is the, let me get this right. So the French song by Jacques Brel is called Ne Me Quitte Pas, and then the English version by Scott Walker is called If You Go Away. And uh, we were s heavily influenced, I think, by kind of the aesthetics or the sort of the tropes of, um, what those songs evoke in the making of this work. So it was a very different piece of work from what the work I just described before in that it was meant to be done just on your own, with your mobile phone, with a pair of headphones, over a couple of hours at dusk in a city as the sun was setting around you. It was an experimental digital work, game-like, art game, game-ish. We call it lots of different things in lots of different contexts, depending how gamey we're feeling. But I think one of the things that is kind of interesting to explore within it is also like how much is it a game? Does that really matter? But because we operate in a contemporary art or a public art context a lot of the time, where those definitions start to slip or start to emerge, I think is also very interesting when you're talking to commissioners or to partners or even to audiences as well. So we made this about five years ago, and that's kind of quite important for a variety of reasons, both because tech has evolved a lot in five years, the cultural context has evolved a lot in five years, we as a company have evolved a lot in five years, and audiences have also evolved a lot in five years. So like, that's something that I'll reference a bunch, um, and it's also quite interesting to reflect on how you then talk about digital work historically. Um, 
So the work was for mobile phones, for iOS and for Android. It took place in the streets, in and around our five, although apparently seven, I'll see if I can list them in a second, commissioning partners who helped us make the work. So um, there was an R&D period which took place in Leeds and a little bit in Berlin, and then when we actually made it, we made it only in the UK, working across Leeds, Coventry, London, Southampton. Oh shit, I should have written it down, shouldn't I? It'll come back to me. Another one. Um, and so, and the idea was that people would meet at the galleries, they would download the app onto their phones, they'd head out into the city streets to explore the experience. There was a multiplayer element. So one of the things that we did is that we took these five cities, one of which remains nameless still, and we layered them on top of each other. So you sort of had Leeds layered on top of Coventry, layered on top of Southampton. And if you were playing it here in Leeds, if you imagine that you're like a pin going down through the layers of the map, you would also be present in all of the other cities underneath. So the geographies kind of overlapped. And so if I was playing it, walking around in Leeds, I would also be able to see a player over there who was playing in Coventry. And so the idea was that we kind of created this slightly sort of open world, very ambient experience, we like to call it, where people walked around these maps of the city, which we kind of reproduced in sort of very low poly, slightly abstract architecture. And they would see each other walking around, they could interact a little bit with each other, and then they could also slightly affect the landscape. There was like some basic physics stuff, they could like knock stuff about at each other. And also there were billboards and bits of graffiti that were in the virtual city that you could then change. So you could then change a billboard that you saw next to the art gallery in Leeds, and then that billboard, which was next to like another art gallery in Coventry, virtually, would then also change. So there was kind of this way that you could talk through space and time a little bit through the app as well. Um, so the whole thing was kind of set in these echoes of the real life cities. So initially we designed it as like a top down map that you would sort of look at this little avatar moving around. And then one day for fun, we just dropped a camera into the map and realized that if you drop a, ca a 3D camera into the map and you're stood in the streets and you do that and you move around, you've created yourself a little bit of accidental AR. And so we sort of ran with that because it was quite an interesting experience. So the idea being that you were then using the phone as a camera or a kind of game-like cinematic lens on which to look at the city that you were physically navigating. So the whole thing was kind of set in this echo of the real life cities. The whole thing had this kind of very melancholic, slow kind of sepia rendering of place. Um, we worked to create a really rich soundscape for it. So the whole thing was drenched in the kind of distant sounds of trumpets playing dirges in this sort of watery world where you were kind of splashing through water at times. A world that was like on the edge of recovering from something or on the edge of breaking into something or maybe it never really was the exact place you're in. We never really explored that. We just kind of wanted to create this thing that felt like it was slightly to the side of the real world. You were kind of looking back onto it through this other lens, through the portal of your device. So what we were trying to do from a slightly more critical perspective was to explore how we could use the mobile phone and game-like experiences to try and impose atmosphere and narrative onto place. So we were trying to maybe take the mundane, the city centers, the high streets, and turn them instead into these highly aestheticized, romantic, sepia-tinged, French smoky cafe places, which I don't know if you've been to Coventry, it's lovely, but it, that's not the vibe, right? Neither is it in Leeds. But we were interested about whether we could try and evoke that and evoke that through the work and have people experience their cities in new ways. At times we flooded it through dreamscapes and people were walking through the ocean trying to get to fishing boats in the distance or we filled it with both real and imaginary places. So like major landmarks were all broken down, skeletons in themselves. So that's, uh, that's the Albert Hall. So that's a very broken down example. Uh, and that's a billboard that someone has, has uh, altered themselves. Um, so we work a lot with sound in our work. We always use a lot of field recordings. The whole thing was like wall-to-wall -wall binaural recordings. And we worked with musicians who recorded a whole new kind of soundscape for us. And we sort of worked with them to create this sort of new folk for this fictional world. Uh, I'll play a little bit at the end. It was very, very beautiful. Um, and it used the 3D, but then it also used a lot of text. And the text was a very, very conscious choice. So what we were interested about text was that it really throttled the audience experience. So we were interested in the idea of it's a game and you are exploring it and it's 
supposed to kind of propel you into the world, but at the same time, these textual moments would appear. And our hope with the text was that it would kind of lend this sort of like literary quality, which would mean people would have to stop, maybe find a bench, maybe sit down, take time to read, take time to process, um, and then make their choices based on what they've read. So it was a real attempt at slowing down audiences as they participate in these experiences. Um, so that idea of asking them to make choices that are led by the story that they're reading rather than the constant act of physical navigation and physically exploring through the game. So really quickly, just about um, the story. The idea with the story is that you followed uh, a small girl called Ada. Um, your relationship with her is pretty unclear as it begins. And as you kind of are exploring the world, you're helping her find a lost object. So it's quite traditionally gamey in that sense. Um, but then gradually, as you're unlocking it, what you sort of work out is that the game is actually a process of mourning. So the idea is that you're helping her in finding this object to let go of somebody, that somebody turns out to be you, it's all very sixth sense. And your relationship to her, though, is gradually left very loose, so it's also for you to establish and for you to kind of decide for yourself within the game who you are to her uh, and what that process is. So the idea was it was very sad, but very, very filled with atmosphere. Um, and also, at one point, you appear as a bear, as kind of like your physical representation of your imaginary friend, and you sort of explore the fictional city as a bear, uh, which is just quite a lovely experience. So you and friends are all digital bears walking through the streets, which is kind of really nice. And so like, in here, you'd be walking down a high street, um, going from lamppost to lamppost as they appear. They kind of become your waypoints in the game. And around you, you hear this funeral dirge that was recorded spatially with actual brass musicians. And you, you can't see it. You can only hear it. And, the more you go, the more players join, and you kind of like complete this procession as you walk down the high street in Leeds or wherever you're playing it. Um, so I think one of the reasons why we sometimes call it a game and sometimes don't call it a game and say that it's game-like or game-inspired is like a lot to do with the, a lot of the influences that it came from, I suppose, but also contextually where we were trying to position it and where we felt it existed in the landscape at the time when we made it. So, uh, like I said, it's four or five years ago, so it's like pre-Pokemon Go, if we can consider that some kind of watershed of locative experiences. But it, it kind of very much is in the sense that I think Pokemon Go created a mainstream language or a mainstream shorthand that you could talk to anybody about locative play. My mother suddenly understood what locative play was. You know, and I think that's a really interesting thing, how culture or mainstream events, I suppose, like something like Pokemon Go, can suddenly make a whole subsection of digital practices suddenly incredibly mainstream and incredibly popular, and you don't have to spend ages explaining how GPS works and yada, yada, yada. But this was pre-Pokemon Go, and um, we were creating this sort of at the tail end of that very big, pervasive game theatre kind of movement that was happening around then. Um, and another one of those kind of high peak moments of that, I suppose, was a thing called 2.8 Hours Later. Has anybody played 2.8 Hours Later? Uh, so for those of you that haven't, it's, uh, it was a hugely successful at its time uh, urban street game based around 28 hours, hang on. Yeah, 28 hours later. Yeah, yeah, the movie, so the zombies. And, um, and the idea was that you, uh, it took 2.8 hours to play this game, which was about a zombie chase game, fundamentally. So you, they would get loads of volunteers. They'd all dress as zombies. You'd start at one point in the city, and you would then like, make your way through the city from checkpoint to checkpoint um, trying to survive, and it's great fun. But I think like, stepping back from it and looking at it critically, when we played it, there was a really fascinating moment, which was when a group of survivors players burst out of the back of like a shopping mall, all screaming and shouting and in fake fear, and having to vault over a bunch of rough sleepers sleeping in the doorway outside. And for me, there was this really fascinating moment right there where there was these two radically different uses of the city that were like clashing head to head. And you sort of go, what then is the function of that back street and who has a priority within their use of it? And there was something very interesting for me that that game really threw up. And especially then, if you take it a little bit further with the tropes of the horror movie that it's exploring, et cetera, et cetera, it kind of created some really fascinating friction points that weren't all entirely comfortable. But 
within the moment, you, there's no space for that because actually you're busy running away from a zombie, you're busy running your next thing, solving your next puzzle. And so it actually creates a lot of super interesting questions around adrenaline and the use of adrenaline in experiences. And I think often when we think of games or we think about playability, we think a lot about laughter, fun, adrenaline, running, high octane stuff. And that's great. And that's fantastic. And I think that creates incredibly memorable, powerful experiences. But I think simultaneously, where does the adrenaline leave room for criticality if you're trying to make a piece of work that is trying to engage with a site or a place or a story in a way that is perhaps um, more intellectual rather than physical? And so that was partly where we were coming from when we set out to make If You Go Away a little bit. So taking that idea of fun and asking about whether there were different ways we could express fun or find fun because there is fun in a Sudoku puzzle in the same way that there is fun in a game of tag. And they're just different energies. And it's a question of how can you use those different energies to create different types of experiences for people. And then the second place we were coming from was kind of a continuation of exploring the use of the mobile phone itself as a site for making work. So the idea that the phone was actually this incredibly intimate opportunity for you to engage with an audience member. Like it's actually one of the most intimate devices that we own. You probably spend more time touching this than you do your significant other in your life every day. So if we can actually use our physical comfort or our physical proximity to this device and all of the technology that it holds within it, and we can then harvest that as well into creating meaningful experiences. That suddenly felt like a very exciting, rich site or a platform within work to develop. And so we wanted to then use all of the kind of tricks, for lack of a better word, that are available to us with a mobile phone. So we obviously used the location. That was a really big one. We used the 3D rendering platforms. We used the fact that it could generate really high quality audio content. We used a lot of the connections to the internet to generate things based on weather. We used all of the accelerometers. We used the microphones to feed sound of the city back into the work or the sound that you leave back into the work. So it kind of became something that you contributed to as much as was delivered to you. And in all of this, we were kind of joked that we were trying to create like the slightly arty, pretentious, smoky, black and white French movie of the GPS game genre, which is kind of like very much what we went into full pelt. Um, we did ask the Braille Foundation whether we could call it Namakitapa, and they wanted like an insane amount of money. So we went for If You Go Away, because we felt like it might be like a loophole, and they didn't catch us until today when it's streaming online. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we made the entire work ourselves. Um, using Unity and Blender. Does that mean stuff to people? Great. Um, so we basically retooled ourselves completely into being a game development studio for an 18-month period, which I do not recommend to anybody ever. It's the worst. We are a really small team, so the bulk of the heavy lifting really fell to two of us, to myself as the developer, and to Victoria, who doing the art direction and the game modeling. And um, we basically learned how to use the tools from scratch with our use and our ability and our technical knowledge sort of growing as we thought of a new feature or a new thing we wanted to do in the game. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing for other artists or studios who maybe don't come from technical backgrounds when they start working, in that you are always in this constant negotiation with your own technical ability, with your size of your ambition, with the tech that's available to you, with the money that you have, and the tech that's available to your audience with the money that they have. And I think this constant negotiation was something that both pushed and also like radically hindered the game and made it incredibly hard to do. So Unity is this incredible tool, but it's also a tool that I despise from the bottom of my heart in that it really made our lives incredibly difficult, but it also would have been impossible to do the project without it. But I think there's a lot of really fascinating nuts and bolts stuff that then needs to happen and that maybe you don't necessarily consider when you are starting out on this journey of trying to release a piece of art with a specific deadline at a specific time. Uh, and especially that concept of like the launch date in a gallery, which rubs up in a really interesting and complicated and sometimes painful way with kind of development cycles. I think we developed an incredibly intimate relationship with the platform, but you become so dependent on it as well that something like a bug can literally just make or break the entirety of your project. And I think like a highlight was, I think, sat in the foyer of the Warwick Art Center and accidentally rolling an update and the entire rendering of our project coming one small rectangle in the top left-hand corner of the screen. And there being nothing we could do about it until they released a, a bug fix about like four days later. 
And so that's like an incredibly difficult cycle to get used to working in. Um, if you maybe have the self-imposed time constraints that we had working around like a multi-city launch on a specific day with a little bit of a live feeling as well. The idea that actually you're working within these constraints that normally come from perhaps many more physical projects. And that kind of really was a complicated and difficult meeting point of cultures for us when we were working on this project. So this was the reality for a lot of our life, which I'm sure it is for a lot of people. It's a real big programmer's joke, and only a few of you have laughed. Okay, that's fine. I find that hilarious. Basically, what that implies is this idea that so much of the project was really relying on this idea of sharing from the community. And so there is, again, this uh, point that you reach when you're working as a small studio, and I'd be interested to hear other people's experiences afterwards as well, where you rely on external resources or external help to a certain degree to perhaps help you solve technical challenges, to get you over certain finish lines. But then that dependency becomes quite a complicated thing potentially as well for you in conversations around authorship and in conversations around ability to then continue to make that work as your work. I think the idea of constantly copying and pasting from Stack Overflow actually raises a lot of interesting questions around ownership. And that was something that we felt very early on in the project, we found ourselves relying super heavily on kind of like downloadable asset packs and resources that other people had made, which are great shortcuts. But then suddenly you find yourself completely trapped in like other people's mistakes or other people's like work and taking that time to actually create the solutions yourself and that negotiation with your own technical ability that I talked about as well and breaking through that is uh, something that really is worth taking the time and the pain barrier to get through as a small studio in terms of longevity. Um, so this was a work that was largely made in gallery foyers, coffee shops, and travel lodge hotel rooms. So because we are such a small team, the, in practice, what it would often mean is like pushing a build to the iPhone, stepping out into Coventry, realizing your GPS point is actually like inside that library over there and that won't work, going back to the Costa, doing the tweak, pushing it again, going back out, only to realize a mile later the same thing has happened. Rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Because I think one of the biggest barriers that we came up against in making this, or one of the constant difficulties, is location. Locative work can only really be made on location. There's only so much you can do in the studio. You actually have to get out there, you have to walk in the streets, you have to see what this is. So every city, the experience began at a... Get, which one's this? Where's the river? Is the river Nair in Leeds? Anyway. Um, yeah, it is. It says Leeds Corn Exchange. It's the River Nair in O'Air, God, honestly, then. Um, so that's Leeds. So, for example, that route was two-ish miles, something like that. It began at the Leeds Art Gallery, took you through all these little back streets, brought you down one of the high streets there, and it ended by a bridge on the water. Wherever we could, we'd end at, like, a vista or a view or a body of water that was kind of, like, quite a nice, important part of the work. So each gallery was incredibly supportive. So in each city, we had the support of a physical location, which kind of gave it the local context and uh, in practical terms also helped kind of us commission and make the project happen. So, and for each gallery, I suppose the work was something slightly different. Um, when we started out in our career making digital work, we often found that the digital thing you do would sort of be the little fun thing that was strapped onto the real art. You know, you'd be the little boondoggle that the marketing department would get to fund. And that often was a really complicated way for you to make work and to understand how you fit into the larger context of a gallery's program. Now, this wasn't the case with this at all. Every gallery uh, was super excited and took the work very seriously, or at least the presentation of it. But it raised an interesting series of processes around the role of bricks and mortars buildings and locative work that doesn't happen in them. And so I think for a lot of galleries, the fact that they obviously were a building meant that it was very important to them that some of the activity at least happened within the walls. And I think you know some of that is down to some totally understandable monitoring stuff, and it's also down to added value and the idea that actually if people aren't coming in to see the rest of the exhibition, which was different in every city again, then maybe they weren't getting the full experience. But... Um, it kind of meant that in every city, who the audience were and how they came to the work was really different, which made messaging, as you can imagine, slightly tricky, uh, and also made fully understanding how you talk about this a really fiddly thing. So I think 
the idea that just because people have an iPhone means that they automatically know how to download an app is like a complete fallacy. The amount of people who were really angry at me because they didn't know they were an Apple ID when they came to, to download it was phenomenal. Or no matter how many times you try and specify a model number, someone's always gonna rock up with like a flip Android phone from like nine years ago. That, that's just what happens. So there's ways around it. You can provide devices, you can lend devices, you can send people out with it. But then there's also that reality of that assumption that just because you know how to use an iPhone or a comfortable way, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody else is. And so you've sent someone out with a device that they don't know, and they'd phone you like a mile down the road being like, oh, I'm lost, or the screen's locked, I don't know how to unlock it, and stuff like that. And so there's all these kind of really fascinating nuts and bolts things that I think still happen around digital access and around digital literacy, which I think are a lot of assumptions that, that we and others have made in the past. And then I think there was the fact that people then had to do stuff, which is super normal. So actually the idea of unlocking your phone or starting an app up is things that you do without thinking about it. But then you present someone with the heightened experience of something that is supposed to be art. And it somehow feels like there's a barrier or a block there that stops people performing very simple tasks. So people forgot how to read maps at a phenomenal level, even if we just present them with a really clear starting point and an end point, because there's this filter, which perhaps isn't always very useful, which is the notion of it being a piece of art. Or even if it's supposed to be a game and you're not used to playing a game, the idea that you're gonna get it wrong. Um, but we try to keep people going on as simple as routes as possible that still kind of perform the function of what we did. Realizing that sometimes also the city is working against you very, very actively. So this is my favorite. This is Southampton, where we ended at a beautiful point by the sea. And three days beforehand, the Great British Boat Show, which is a thing, turned up and took over this whole part of the dock, which means our entire ending experience couldn't actually be accessed. This was three days before the launch. Uh, we didn't have time to push an update to the App Store, which meant actually, if you got like three quarters of the way through the experience, you just simply couldn't finish it. Um, so... <laughs> This became a really important website for us in the process. So these days, we've released three apps since, and it's generally been around the two-day mark on the left. So this basically tells you how long it takes on average to release your app onto Apple. It seems to these days largely hover around two days. Back when we were making If You Go Away, it was constantly up at around the seven and 10 mark, which means that actually one mistake that you need to edit or uh, getting pushed back from the review can cost you like 14 days of time. And that's like an incredibly crippling thing potentially. Again, if you're working around this much more traditional theater or gallery model of launching and opening on a certain date because there's an exhibition and people are coming to drink the free bottles of Bex, that's a super hard thing to negotiate around. And so we found ourselves trying to beg and plead with Apple, who obviously don't care because we're like the smallest fish in the pond, right? We're not even charging for this thing. And trying to like get them to change the App, the app Store review times. And, and so like the App Store becomes this place which feels like with the click of a button you have a piece of work that's available to the world but again just because it's on the app store doesn't mean anybody's going to download it or if they do download it maybe they don't mean to download it or if you said only available in Leeds, Coventry and somewhere else and they're in Nottingham and they downloaded it and then one star you and are furious at you forever and that's the only review on your app for like three months there's nothing you can do about that because that's just the experience of the app store and I think we found culturally as well, there was a really fascinating thing about the App Store, which is you're coexisting with very different products than the thing that you're making. If you're trying to make something that is perhaps a little complicated, perhaps is a little broken, doesn't always work, needs a little bit of love, needs a little bit of personal face time to just kind of nip and tuck and get people through the experience, but they're like judging you alongside Candy Crush, that, that, that's, like, that's a really complicated relationship you've got with your audience and how you communicate that and how you process reviews and how you process feedback and technical stuff and, and all of that. And so, again, it becomes this, this, this place that, um, although in, interestingly though, when I opened up the App Store the other day, there was this whole category which was called something like beautiful, dreamy games for sleepless nights. And I was like, that's amazing. And there's all these really beautiful games on there now that are being curated into a section. And I was like, that's incredible. Like, that's such a different curatorial perspective that Apple are now bringing to the App Store than maybe again existed like five years ago where you could class yourself as a game with no real like subsections within that, which kind of was very tiring at times. <laughs> and so I think this expectation gap between what digital is and what digital does 
is still a fascinating thing that we're still negotiating with a lot of partners that we work with. So the idea that it simply never is a silver bullet, whether it comes to content distribution or to audience engagement or to any of those things. And actually, it needs negotiation and explanation and handholding as much as a uh, other piece of contemporary art in a gallery would. It's just that perhaps it's dressed up in the trappings or it has the familiarity of something else. Um, a recent commissioner, when we were debugging like a simple touchscreen thing that we'd done somewhere, was like, well, if I'd bought a car, I'd expect it to work straight out of the shop, which was a charming analogy, but um, also like incredibly incorrect because you just go, A, notwithstanding all the millions of dollars of R&D, but the idea that if we're trying to make things that are slightly different in the digital space, and whether that's different for the public or even that's different for us as practitioners, I think you are up against a different set of restrictions and a different set of problems and a different set of to and fro with your audiences and, and with your partners around notions of success and failure and access. And I think those are things that where technology sits in a really fascinating way within brick and mortar contexts. So because of that, we did try and provide a kind of a portal into the work for people who were just randomly rocking up at a gallery. So in the experience, there's this like vocal recording booth. Uh, which is supposed to be like a phonograph booth, so you used to be able to go into these things and record a song and it would print it onto vinyl for you. So there's a, there's a digital one in the game and also in the ambient world and you could go in and you could record something through your phone and it would get uploaded online and then if you found the virtual phonograph booth, you could listen to other people's stuff. But then we um, wanted to create uh, a physical one that could then sit in real places that looked exactly like the one in the digital world that people could go into. They couldn't cut onto vinyl because it's horrifically expensive, but they could record a song and it would get uploaded online. And it kind of was just like a little, you know, that's a bit like the digital thing. It's kind of like a bridge. Um, and so people really enjoyed this. So we did this at the VNA uh, where we launched the app, uh, which is one of the most successful iterations of it actually around the kind of streets of London. Um, and we had people queuing for this. People were queuing for it, taking selfies in it, doing the little recording song. We did not have people queuing to download the app. And that was partly, I think, because of uh, that distance still between the digital and then the steps that you still need to take to open your phone, to go to the app store, to search for the thing, to log on to the free Wi-Fi because actually it's full of sound and content. It takes you five minutes to download it. And like five minutes and you're stood around with a bunch of strangers waiting for them all to download and then one of them fails. That's like a really long time. And that's like a lot of front of house management for you and then the Wi-Fi drops out and then obviously, you know, and all of that. And so I think it's all this like nuts and bolts stuff around launching apps or in a, a really kind of like narrow context like this where you actually become reliant on so many external factors that aren't actually to do with the work, that are to do with internet speeds, that are to do with people's memory on their phones, that's to do with all this other stuff. Um, and the negotiation and managing that is still something that we work on today when we try and do things. Um, so there was the ambient world, which was when you downloaded the phone and at any point of the day, you could wave it around and you could see the 3D world of the game. Um, and the story, so that kind of narrative element, only unlocked at sunset. But most people only have really interacted with this through the ambient world. So that was partly because we sort of realized this afterwards. We'd impose this increasingly restricting, restrictive set of co like conditions on people being able to access the game. So like A, in say Coventry, the size of an audience for a slightly alternative, well, the, the amount of people who go to a gallery, say, is like this big. Then the amount of people who want to play a slightly weird digital thing is like this big. Then the amount of people who have time is like this big. Then the amount of people who actually come to you is this big. The amount of people who are there at eight o'clock in the evening when the sun's actually setting is like this big. So like we basically shot ourselves massively in the foot by kind of creating this ever decreasing set of restrictions around the work. But for those who did play the game, I'd say like maybe 60, 70% of them actually made it through to the end. Which, oh, sorry, which um, in the context of a game and the puzzles that we had in the game, which were very much kind of like 90s Monkey Island, Manic Mansion, not if you know what I'm talking about, excellent, kind of puzzle games. So 
Uh, and those are hard, right? Like, everyone got stuck on those games. No one really completed those games, really. Uh, and we had some puzzles, and they were really hard. And they were especially hard if you had no literacy in that game culture. So actually, if you don't necessarily know the thing about picking up an object and going back over there to do that with, you know, all of that kind of stuff, that is actually quite complicated. That's quite a complicated set of mechanics to be able just to take on board yourself. Which means people would get stuck or they would not be able to solve the puzzle, and they stop playing, which is totally fair enough. But within a context of making a piece of art, a piece of publicly subsidized art, within the parameters of great art for everyone and accessibility, how do we then process failure, or how do we process losing? How do we process getting stuck at a puzzle? And what is our obligation then as designers or makers to handhold or to set difficulty levels or to all of that kind of stuff, which I then think is a really fascinating question around games full stop and games existing in a context where we have to consider accessibility and absolutely we should consider accessibility perhaps in a different way than people do in a commercial sphere. And then how do we then negotiate the fact, how valid is someone going, well, I couldn't solve the puzzle and us going, yeah, it's pretty hard. Or do we then have an obligation to actually be like, yeah, sure, totally, so do this, do that, do that, do that. And so, so we settled somewhere in the middle, which is we put the answers at the bottom of the FAQ, so if you could be bothered to actually go looking for it, you would be able to find them. But it's still kind of like, sorry, keeps, it's still kind of asked, I think, a lot of uh, interesting questions again, a lot of interesting questions, a lot of interesting questions around uh, winning and losing and what that means in the context of um, experiences like this. So, it was hard, that would be the other thing I would say. It was physically hard. Walking, to, not everyone walks two miles all the time. Like, you know, it's the north of England, it gets cold in November. Walking two miles is not always something that you want to do. And maybe you'd not brought the right shoes or you'd not brought the right coat. Or when you started at six, it was fine. And when you finished at 7.30 on the bridge, it really wasn't anymore. And so the idea of physicality and of the city and of the reality of walking through a locative experience then becomes something that you really have to try and incorporate within the design as much as you possibly can. We had a lot of slightly less charming encounters with the city. Uh, one of our playtesters, when she was playing on her own, was followed by someone, and we had some other stuff like that happen, which is sadly the reality of what sometimes happens in city centers. And again, that brought me back to thinking around the stuff around two point hours later and where two different experiences of urban space rub up against each other and how does yours make way or give passage to the other uses and how do you allow that flexibility and that safety in your design for someone who you have sent out into the streets at dark on their own to do some art and they get followed and what's your responsibility and your duty towards them in terms of how you then staff that and man that and how you allow for that to happen and when it's freely available in the App Store for anybody to download at any point in time, and actually it's supposed to be untethered from those normal um, personnel considerations, perhaps, of like a pervasive theatre experience. How do, you, how do you enable that? And there's also the fact that walking around a city like this is quite an aggressive thing. And actually, it's not until you stop and take a photo, that's really quick. But then you're doing this, and you're walking around people's space, and you're up and, you know, and that's, that's actually a very aggressive gesture. So we kind of tweeted a bit, we kind of changed the camera angle so you walked more like that, but the camera was still facing forward. And, but it also really highlighted that thing of, I always think that you know, if there's like an arts festival on and people are doing like a digital walk, you can always tell because they've got that like digital art walk thing where people walk a little bit more slower and they're a little bit more aware of their surroundings because you're sort of listening really intently. This kind of had that as well, but with that added sense that you were just so visible because you just had your phone out and you were kind of doing this lost tourist thing. But in the city where you live, trying to solve puzzles and it kind of put people actually in this potentially vulnerable position as well when they were playing which again is the meeting point between the real world and the realities of of a modern city in britain and these kind of alternative experiences that we're trying to create and like there's something political in that and there's something i think quite vital and important of how do we then tell stories in those spaces but there's also something about the ethics of that, and who are we to impose narratives onto these other places. Um, so, as the experience sort of came to an end, and you'd done your, your two miles, and you sort of released the balloon at one point, which floats off over the virtual city, and you sort of arrive at the bridge, 
and you, you get to do one of the favorite things, which is like my favorite thing that we've ever created in a piece of work ever, and it's incredibly moving and beautiful, and I'll try and play a little bit of the music. That was made for it. Let me see. There we go. Um, so this was made by a colleague of ours called Simon Wainwright, who's a lovely musician. And you, um, so yes, yeah, so you arrive at this bridge and you kind of, it all starts to wrap up and the story starts to conclude and the little girl is there and she kind of releases you metaphorically and actually and you sort of have this option to do this last dance and then it gets you to embody the last dance by sort of twirling with her. So the virtual snow falls, it's all very cheesy cinematic, but in the moment it's lovely. And you actually have to like progress the story, you have to stand there and spin with her and kind of twirl with her and it's really beautiful and there's this thing where then the physical durational two hour walk, not two hours, two mile walk that you've just been on and the whole act of doing the game really kind of plays out in this very beautiful cathartic moment as you sort of then for the first time kind of really embody what one of the characters is doing and you actually twirl and twirl and twirl with this fictional child, potentially your child, who you're kind of like seeing for the last time as you kind of drift away across the city and this lovely music plays and it kind of is this moment where like all of the cinematic tropes that we were going for kind of clinch together. You're on a bridge and the night's just fallen around you and it kind of is still for all like the hardship and the difficulties and the mistakes and everything that we did within the work, this still remains like one of the things that I'm probably the most proud of just in that little moment and that little vignette of experience that we gave. Sadly, far too few people because not that many people got to the end. but. I still love it possibly the most of any of the things that we've done. But um, we have what we then did with the project, because even though it was a project created for multiple cities, it's like impossible to tour because actually it was so specific to a place. You've got to remodel the city, you've got to spend time, like it's just, it's a nightmare. But what we did instead is we kind of stripped out the component parts that we really liked in the use of the device and in the idea of different lenses put onto cities, and we um, did a, a, a sort of a very, di very different version of it, really, uh, which was for uh, Lagos in Nigeria. Um, let me see if I can just put it onto this screen. Oh, God. Yeah, here we go. Uh, which took a lot of the key elements of the work, but really just stripped them down to this one, which was the audience's interaction with the city, rather than us pulling this story onto it. Um, because whether, when, where we were questioning our rights or the ethics of us putting a narrative onto, say, Coventry, the ethics of us putting a narrative onto Lagos is like even more stacked high. And so actually what we did instead is we used the, the same aesthetics and the same language and the same digital tools but strip the experience back to basically allow other people, inhabitants of Lagos, to create their experience within the app. So it's called I Dream of Lagos. Is that it? So again, it was the idea of uh, getting people to slow down and to sit and take their time. And so we couldn't network across places. Instead, we networked two strangers within a park with two network devices. Uh, and they both kind of walked through dream versions of the city that they built for themselves by kind of leaving recordings and choosing things within the, within the text. Um, and we did it all within this little park called Freedom Park in Lagos. Um,
And so I think the success here was actually then not worrying quite so much about the narrative and the authorship and instead kind of surrendering a lot of that over to the audiences. But taking that idea of the intimacy of the device and of the connections that we can have through it and using that to allow people to connect with the environments and put their own cinematic lens on top of their own city rather than us necessarily proposing our own. So, I do believe that was me. Let me get out of this. There we go. There we go. So, that's everything I have. Thank you very much. Uh, that's our website. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, gosh, how refreshing as well to hear about um, you know, a project, hear about um, an artist um, freely talk about failure <laughs> when things don't kind of go as we want them to go, because of course that happens all the time. And um, uh, yeah, really thank you for talking about that, because it's something that's we don't talk that, about that anything like enough. Um, but it sort of seems like a theme that's emerged over the two days, because it's something that Simon was talking about a lot yesterday from Gob Squad as well. And it's really, really, really important that we fail, of course, always. So, yeah. I think, sorry. I think as well, there's a... I'd be interested to hear from if there's any in the room, because I think not only failure for you as a practitioner in your making process, but I think that relationship that you have with a commissioner or with someone who is also expecting you to deliver work or a product, I think the role of failure in digital somehow feels very different and perhaps because you know the role of failure in live performance to a certain degree when we do live work you can kind of you know you can like dodge around it or make it charming it's harder to make a crash on a piece of software charming you know and so like, I think how do we how do we talk about that and how do we talk about the difficulties and the 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 fact that often again like it comes down to physicality like often it comes down to trying to do ambitious things that that you aren't always going to swing and hit. You're not going to swing and miss either, but you might just like catch the side of it, do you know what I mean? And it's how do we reframe that and have a conversation around that and make people feel confident and not necessarily see failure as failure, but failure as alternative outcomes. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. And um, I think Ben's going to stick around. So, um, oh yeah, that reminds me that just um, do be thinking um, as we kind of go through the afternoon about any questions you want to ask at the end, because we're planning to have that same panel machine at the, get, at, at the end, and there should be an opportunity to ask questions of everyone you hear from this afternoon, but also um, for those who are still with us um, who led the experiences this morning, they'll be around too if you've got questions specifically about um, the experiences. Um, but um, now I'd like to invite Layla Johnston um, to come and talk. Are you here, Layla? Oh. She was here. Can you, I think Alice is going to um, see if she can find her. Um, Layla, I'll tell you what I know about Layla. Layla is um, the digital curator of the Site Gallery in Sheffield. Um, and she... Um, runs something called the Hack Circus, which is a magazine and a series of immersive events. Um, so she's um, going to talk to us about joining the Hack Circus, which is an uh, exciting proposition. And here she is. Circus? 
You know, oh, two over there, a few over there, good. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about my project Hack Circus and a little bit about some, I suppose, learnings from it. And I mean, this is all kind of so subjective from my experience, and a lot of you will have a lot more experience than I do in uh, putting on shows and doing this kind of thing, I'm sure. So it's just kind of a, a little journey through some of the things I've picked up over the last few years. So over the years, um, I've created quite a lot of things for and with the public. Um, I've done things like um, I've made magazines, comics, and audio, I've done lots of podcasts. Um, Hack Circus, such I'm going to speak about a little bit, is, uh, is a magazine as well as an event series. And um, yeah, and, and loads of, and I started out doing comics when I was very young. Um, had a few uh, joke books published, including this game book, which was also um, actually an app. I was just reminded, watching that brilliant talk, by the way, from Invisible Flock. Um, this Enemy of Chaos uh, was from 2009, so it's 10 years ago I did that. And it's a, an interactive game book, sort of fighting fantasy spoof uh, satirical thing. And it was also, yeah, an, an iPhone app at the time, which was quite fun for 2009. Um, I've always made comedy websites, which is kind of how I've um, been able to get into doing books and things, because some of them were quite popular and were picked up by publishers, which was fun. And then, I, and then I, I suppose I drifted into the arts through sort of a diagnosis of exclusion. Um, I didn't really fit in anywhere else, and the arts embraced me, so that was nice. So I ended up, I suppose, describe myself more as an artist, although I still feel like... I think I feel legitimately that, that that's um, not right and inappropriate, not in a sort of um, imposter syndrome way. I genuinely don't think that <laughs> it's fair on everyone else to call me an artist. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll see why. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, and I now make um, immersive experiences in shows. Um, and I'm also the, uh, as may have, I'm, I missed my own introduction, but <laughs> I may have been uh, described as the digital curator at the Site Gallery in Sheffield, um, which is one of my jobs at the moment. And um, we've just reopened, and we're uh, three times the size. We've got huge hall-like space, bigger than this room now, next to us. Uh, if you ever over in Sheffield, go and, go and see what's going on at site because it's really amazing. Um, but yeah, I, I'm quite tired today because, um, as you can imagine, the, <laughs> the last year and a half has just been a massive build-up to literally building this extension and then, um, and then reopening with a series of parties. So it's, like, it's not the work so much as the recreation um, that kills you in the arts, I think. It's been exhausting uh, in, a, in a nice way, but still. And then I've got... Um, a new Hack Circus show, spoilers, this week, uh, coming up on Thursday. So anyway, yes, lots on. Um, and uh, yeah, let's move on to this. So what's Hack Circus? So in 2013, um, I've, I've always made magazines, and I thought it would be great to launch a magazine that was a real beautiful object, real thing, um, that was kind of about science and technology, but not really. It was more kind of finding the magical, fun, dark humor place. Um, so again, people like me who make things um, and write things that don't quite get accepted by the artistic community usually, because they're a bit too funny or a bit too, uh, I don't know, a bit too satirical or something. Um, and then also really interesting art projects that really that address um, issues like climate change uh, in quite sincere ways. Um, if, they're, if, if they seem to fit the sort of character of Hack Circus, we'd, we'd feature those as well. Um, and often people who weren't really featured anywhere else, I quite like to give them the opportunity to be in print in a nice magazine. So I, I went out of my way to find people who didn't really have that much coverage elsewhere. Um, and uh, yeah, and it still continues in some forms to this day. To my great surprise, I was given a residency um, at Access Space in Sheffield to do an extra sort of epilogue style show after two and a half years after the last one. So we're doing a mini um, workshop sized version of Hack Circus on Thursday, which will be fun. Um, and the magazine contained things like entertaining how to's as well, like this uh, paper craft tunnel of hell um, based on. <laughs> 
on uh, Meadow Hall in Sheffield, which is a massive shopping centre, uh, Meadow Hell, and uh, it's got a, a little red LED at the very end that kind of illuminates it with a, an eerie red glow, which is nice. Um, and then we have things like how to make a, a, an all-seeing eye pyramid to predict, uh, you know, it was, like, it was like a kind of magic eight ball but with an Arduino, I think. We had all the code for that, somebody designed for us. Same person, actually, who made that, um, Jan Hopkins, she's amazing. Um, you won't have heard of her again. She's a fantastic Sheffield-based artist. Um, and things like knitting patterns for the Arecibo message, which was a um, radio message encrypting all the information about DNA and humans and everything that the aliens would need to know that was sent into space in the 70s and we showed you how to knit uh, your own version of that. So all these kind of imaginative projects. Oh, Nellie Bent Hayoun's domestic volcano we had. Um, the volcano that sits in the living room and randomly erupts all over your carpet at surprising moments that she designed. <laughs> She's brilliant as well. And we have the roller coaster design from um, Julian uh, Urbonus, Julianus Urbonus, who made, a, a, you've probably seen the uh, euthanasia roller coaster that, um, it's a roller coaster design that will kill you through the G-force, for ever, ever decreasing loop, loop things. So featuring that sort of thing, you get you get the ideas, that sort of stuff. Um, and each episode had a theme. Uh, sorry, each issue had a theme, which was then explored. Uh, every other magazine we explored with a live show. And um, and these became increasingly weird and immersive as time went on. Um, I commissioned original work out of the ticket price, which might have included writing, acting, dance, music, and interactive sculptures. Each event took place in a, di in a, a, a different kind of universe or story world. So we had one that was um, an adventure into the underworld. That was the last one we did, a musical about the underworld. Uh, we had a journey to a distant planet where 50 people came into space with us and, um, and we left them there. Um, <laughs> And, uh, and yeah, the one that we have in, uh, this week is going to be a boardroom meeting of a distant future race. Um, but all of them, they're not just kind of plays, they're, they're barely plays, really. They're sort of um, performed conferences. So the, the uh, experts come in and I make them wear things. Um, all the ones in, in this week are going to wear uh, like pointy party hats with an eye stuck to it because it's kind of a... Um, f futuristic Masonic Lodge uh, based on, instead of basing on the Freemasons, it's based on the digital era, because it's the distant future. They have this thing about the digital ancients. Anyway, something else you could look at. Um, but uh, yeah, all the experts are, are exceptionally high caliber, always really good fun, always up for performing a bit and taking part in the story world with everyone else. Um, and uh, and yeah, and I really just wanted to kind of combine the delivery of this interesting and surprisingly true information with this play and improvisation element too. People are often um, astonished that there are values behind Hack Circus, but there are. Um, the first one, I really wanted to offer an alternative. So I think that digital has created new opportunities for everyone else. You know, we've still got the physical world, we've still got print. Um, we've still got physical sculptural objects. Not, you know, digital can do wonderful things, but there's an opportunity to interact um, with real stuff that's not not always appreciated. Uh, and you can still bring digital into it and use digital, but not everything has to be um, invisible and virtual. And there are great there's a great amount of excitement I think about just being present in a room sometimes, um, especially am among a community who are used to being behind screens all sort of trapped in a, um, a simulation, if you like. Um, and yeah, so the, I think that science and technology events and um, publications can be quite um, didactic sometimes, or I'd say at best uh, a little bit knowing, and you kind of, you feel like you need to be part of this group who share a lot of common um, stances and backgrounds. And, and, the, and I, I felt like there was a chance to do something that was a little bit weirder and more credulous, you know, not, not based in the kind of the cool science gang and the sort of cool atheism gang, um, but not unreasonably weird, something sort of accessible that covers 
all the areas that we find uh, fascinating and fun, but which as adults we don't always admit that we do. So there's lots of magic. I always think that people are very embarrassed to admit they like magic, but um, even like to the point of like real close-up magic, people will be like, oh, get away from me when a magician comes up to your table. No, um, but actually you kind of love it. Um, so, I, so I try and <laughs> impose magic on people uh, to prove their, their, their misperceptions. And um, yeah, and I felt that we didn't need to lecture or preach or use this kind of knowing in crowd sort of humor, um, but that we could do something through making and making together. So we kind of create something with our combined imagination. That's the, the ideal of it, really. Um, anyone can take part in a hack circus and, uh, and get something out of it, is, is, my, is my goal. Um, and then, yeah, I really wanted to show that everyone can perform, everyone can imagine, and really that as a whole, we can achieve more than we can as individuals. I think there's this um, sort of sage on the stage mythology that persists in the conference world, I suppose, to this day. And I realized after doing a couple of these shows that I was, I was responding to it, and I was saying, here's a different way of doing this. Um, and there were loads of conferences happening, at a certain point, everyone suddenly came of age, I think, about five, ten years ago, and realized they could just run a conference. So everyone started to do it. And I thought, oh, these are all a bit the same. You see the same people, all of them, you hear the same things. Maybe there's something else we can do. Um, but also getting people who are traditionally from the arts, or the sciences, or academia, or engineering, or writing, or any of these kind of different disciplines where they've got really good in their own area, and getting them to work really quite intensively towards a common goal um, of creating this experience for the audience and for themselves. Um, and, I, and I feel like that was actually quite a good demonstration of the lack of meaningful distinction between those fields, because everyone sort of comes together and you're all just almost like a blitz spirit thing, but also we all create, we all kind of come up with ideas for each other too. So that there became a kind of core team as the shows went on who took part in a lot of them and really got it. And then each one would have new people involved too, which was really lovely. Um, so yeah, it's important to me to dissolve these boundaries, audience, performer, scientist, artist, etc., and find this common humanity. Like what is it that we actually all have in common that we can enjoy together? So, and finally, yeah, to level hierarchies, which is sort of um, what I've been saying, I think. So I'm gonna share a few observations and tips that I've picked up over my years of creating these imaginative uh, experiences for audiences. I've tried to ensure they'll apply more broadly to anyone embarking on a project where they need to access someone else's imagination. So, so there's a, <laughs> this, this oxygen mask thing comes up a lot, so I thought I'd just jump on that bandwagon. Um, yeah, I, I think um, it's quite easy to imagine that everyone wants to be in charge and they don't. Uh, so I found that what's really good is to trust your first instinct. When you first start doing a project, the thing that you're excited about, don't, don't let go of it, I guess. Start, um, really trust it and believe it and go with it and then people will come with you. Um, there, there are times to compromise, and obviously you're surrounded by experts and really clever people. You must listen to them. They always come up with ideas and contributions that are absolutely perfect. And you have to be humble, but the first voice to listen to, if you're the one starting the project, is of course your own. Um, if you want to see a really, a really good stroke, bad example of uh, something that's been designed by committee, I recommend in York, uh, go over to the Minster, and there's a statue of um, Emperor Constantine, I think, in front of the Minster. And he's just kind of sitting in a chair, and he's smaller than life size, I think, just slightly. And it's, it's very <laughs> distressing um, and green as well, weirdly. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, this, this is <laughs> what I always think of. And I think, should we, should we all get our heads together and come up with the, the, uh, you know, the, the overlap of all our ideas? And that's, that's the kind of thing that happens, I think, sometimes. So, yeah, don't, don't dilute your vision until you have to, um, if at all. The, the thing, when, when you work with people with different skills to you, it's a joy, and everyone's the expert in their own field, um, and they're actually looking to you as the person starting it to be the lens to focus everything. So 
you have to kind of remember that they want you to be a safe pair of hands and they want you to know what you're doing with their stuff. Um, they don't necessarily want to be you and that's sometimes difficult to keep in mind when you kind of keep backing down and going, okay, let's use more and more of the uh, everyone else's ideas. Uh, it's quite important to, to stand firm. Um, let's just check I've said all those things. So yeah, just really embrace your role as the initiator, as the person who planted the seed, and it'll really be a relief to people, if anything. Um, if you put your oxygen mask on first, your oxygen of imagination mask on first, then your work will actually be more consistent, and, um, and everyone involved will have a better experience. So give yourself permission to make decisions. Okay, so especially when we're working in uh, the fantasy world, as I do, I suppose, um, I think people forget that you're, well, it's easy to forget that you're working with truth. And as many of you know, fantasy is a great way to access truth without, um, without being too confrontational about it or too obvious, I suppose. So you can sort of say things in a, an exciting and palatable way that you might not be able to do in, in uh, a lot of other ways. Um, there aren't actually many things that are true, I think. Uh, I think if you're, if you're like me and you're kind of, I suppose, quite, well, quite broad thinking or if you're really, um, uh, more sort of cynical about it, not particularly empathetic, it's, um, it's easier to think about the things that are true for most people. And um, the things that are true for most people, there aren't that many. It's things like life and death and uh, you know, sadness and joy, and uh, th there aren't that many. Um, so a project that I suppose I, where I explored some of those kind of things. I did this thing <laughs> uh, after we did the last Hack Circus show. I got this pitch through to um, the Brighton Digital Festival and the Brit British Science Festival. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's a... <laughs> It's a sort of pop-up, whoops, went too far, my gosh, spoilers. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of pop-up um, volunteer-led experience uh, <laughs> where you um, can upload your consciousness to the digital matrix to um, help with the, the research of the fantastical organization called uh, MORTI, can't remember what it stands for now, but the uh, the the subheading was a cure for life. I remember that. And, uh, and you, you get inside and you watch a video and you have to make things. And the process is to do with um, purifying your consciousness uh, ahead of being uploaded to the digital realm. Um, and the, the balloons there. <laughs> we had a bit where you had to write your regrets on a balloon and then the, uh, the nanoparticles in the cover of the booth would lift your balloon and your regrets away and your, you would feel relieved as a result. And of course we just ended up with this like graveyard of regrets filling the gallery <laughs> after we'd had quite a few people in there. But that, that was good fun. But it was, it was funny and silly and, um, you know, one person, there's a bit where you had to do some puppeteering with your arms sticking out of the tent. And it was ridiculous. Um, but it was about death. And, and at the end, you had this, uh, you, got, you got printed out a uh, paper wristband, not, not unlike the one I'm wearing today, um, which uh, I think said to get your body to a, um, a quiet place or something and enjoy your last, you're told to enjoy your last 24 hours because your body will now wind down now that you've uploaded your consciousness. So everyone kind of came out on a bit of a down, <laughs> but um, the highs and the lows of, of doing art, I suppose. Um, but it's that, you know, it's, it's, it's a thing about um, finding the things that are seriously worth saying, I suppose. That's what it's been for me. So even though humour is one of my languages, I suppose, in fantasy, um, it's it's to the end of saying something that's worth saying to everyone um, because it applies to everyone and, and everyone gets something out of that. Well, perhaps almost everyone. Um, yeah, so another example uh, which you may have already seen. Um, the, uh, this is kind of a... Uh, I mean, you know that the League of Gentlemen, they're a, a, um, a sketch troupe from the 90s uh, who've recently come back and done loads more stuff and they're just amazing performers. 
um, and I saw them live recently, which is why I was thinking them in this context. But they do, they do these characters who are one, at once very extreme and grotesque and fantastical, but also um, very, very recognisable and very ordinary. Um, I moved over, when these, they started doing these characters and their show first came on TV, it was probably the mid, no, was late 90s, I think. And um, I just moved from the Isle of Man to York, actually. Um, and it, it was just so, like, so, so recognised. It's like these, the, the, two, the two who run the local shop who just kind of come, come in asking if you're local and won't let you touch any of the precious things. And, and I was just watching it with my partner at the time who's also from the Isle of Man. I'm like, this is, how did they know? This is exactly what it was like. Um, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's absurd and, you know, um, extreme. But it, it works because there's something recognisable there. And, of course, Pauline, the, the lady who works in the job centre and her only friends are pens. Um, pens? Uh, she's amazing. But, yeah, if you get a chance to see that, they're, they're on tour at the moment and the, the show is excellent. Um, so my next tip, uh, third tip of four, I think, don't be dazzled. So this, this is also the tip. This, the other name for this tip is... Um, the naming the project before you know what the project is problem. And I think creative people love to sort of um, lull themselves into this delightful reverie, imagining all the lovely words and, <laughs> and what, the, what the graphic might look like and what image they'll use on the website and what their team should be called and things like this. Um, and this is why projects never get started, let alone finished. Because we don't think about the, we think about the fun bit first, um, which you don't have to do to some extent, of course. But but it's it's not including things that don't make the project better. I suppose this point is really about frills uh, are expensive, so they're expensive in money. Obviously, they're also expensive in time. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we put into our projects that we can our work would be better. I think if we didn't include. Unless you're putting on a West End musical, it's not really good value to put loads of money into building a set. Um, you can work with a lot less than you think you can. And actually, this kind of thinking really speeds you up and gives you less opportunity to just sit around making excuses and waiting for everything to be perfect before you even get started. So in my experience, production values can be very minimal. Um, I mean, in my experience, they're extremely min minimal because it's very imagination-based, um, but also very profound or... Um, or moving, you don't need a lot of stuff to, to create an emotion. Um, you wouldn't feel, I've, I've said here, you wouldn't feel the need to create the most photorealistic painting in order to make an impact. So why do, why do we feel we have to do that with performance or with other art forms? Um, and I mean, a great thing that I've found really useful in, in creating these experiences is getting people to close their eyes. It's something as simple as that. It's, it's sort of something you're not very regularly asked to do, unless you're um, a child, I think. Um, a lot of what we experience now is highly visual. One of the best experiences that we had at, at a Hack Circus was actually in the first one, which was all themed on time travel. And this lady, Tanya Asan, who's a, um, a journalist, did an amazing time travel meditation where everyone closed their eyes and she led them through to meet their future self. And it was, uh, it, it was so... Um, effective. It was really surprisingly emotional, and people were crying. Um, I can believe it. So it was, it was things like that. It's just somebody talking. It, that's that's uh, that's interactive. You know, that's immersive. And um, personally, I try. And, I prefer to use as little digital as I can get away with, and ideally still get digital funding. <laughs> um, the problem is that if you use a lot of digital effects, it becomes about digital quite often, um, or it becomes in that family of digital projects. And I, th I think I've realized recently, I'm not even really a digital artist. I think at the best I'm a media artist. I do make things other than Hack Circus, um, and a lot of them are media or screen or LED based. Um, but I'm not, I'm not very interested in digital culture, um, but that's, I suppose, a talk for another time. Another problem is that technology always breaks, always, something will break, um, and, uh, and paper and pen never really does. So don't underestimate the value of that when you're trying to make something quickly, cheaply, and in a high-pressure environment, especially just with people's imaginations. 
And the examples of that, I mean, I could think of loads. Um, think of things like escape rooms. If you, how many of you done escape room? Bet most of you have. Yeah, it's the, they're generally um, very uh, low budget, I guess. A, a lot of them are, and the ones that are high budget don't have really jazzy effects. I know some of them are virtual reality and stuff like that, but some of the best ones I've done have just been a case of pens and papers, a couple of like uh, little tiny lasers. Um, and actually, the lasers were the thing in mind that meant that we didn't get out because they weren't working properly. So again, technology fails you. Um, things like simple card games that persist. Um, I was thinking about impressions. There's a, there's a show on Sunday nights now uh, that's just like a panel show for impressionists. And there's a round in that where they just have to guess the impression they're doing from one word or a sound. Uh, and they have to guess the entire person just from that. And there's exercises like that that I think are really interesting, just capturing a whole story or a whole person in one movement or one sound and the sort of skill that's involved in that. It's quite amazing to me. Um, simple props, things like Nina Conti, if you've seen her uh, do the, the monkey thing and then, you know, gradually it just becomes a hand, but somehow it's still the monkey. It's, it's amazing to me. And again, League of Gentlemen, the first half of their live show they do it all in their tuxedos, but they do all the characters from the TV show, and you know exactly who they're being, just from where they're standing or something like that. It's, it's astonishing. Um, so don't, don't play to a specific audience. Uh, again, this is just my experience, but I think we have this kind of marketing-minded marketing influence on us now where um, we think about people as kind of groups that spend money, so we sort of lose sight of the fact that real humans are not meaningfully connect connected by um, sharing the same postcode or, uh, or holiday destination or preference for a, a brand of alcohol or whatever. Um, people are meaningfully linked by life and death and movement and love and fear. Uh, these are the things that, that we should be thinking about in terms of grouping people, I think. This is one of the problems. Uh, I love this Charles Bukowski quote, uh, we're all going to die, all of us. What a circus. That alone should make us love each other, but it doesn't. We're terrorized and flattened by trivialities. We're eaten up by nothing. Um, brilliant. Uh, yeah, e even in the arts, though, we are running a business, and I think we do forget what, what makes us important to each other. And actually, we should be kind of spearheading the, the idea of uh, what's really important. Um, I would say that the, the art gives us an opportunity to be aware of individual audience members, uh, whether you're making a group production or just something for one person at a time, you still have to think of people as individuals rather than imagining that there are types of people. But it's so easy to do, we sort of think, well, if we make this thing with this kind of humor or this kind of look to it, we'll get this group of people who, will, who, who are all joined by this interest and they'll all turn up and like a big army of chuckling robots They'll all enjoy that thing, and then they can go, and we've collected our money. Um, and I've been criticised before for creating things that I find interesting and enjoyable, rather than conducting some kind of mass observation study before everything I make. Uh, I was actually asked in one memorable residency interview, um, are you just doing things that entertain you, rather than considering your audience's preferences? Um, which I, I had to think about quite a lot. I thought, well, yeah, I am, but... Uh, but I think that they like it too. I don't know, is that not okay to, is, as an artist? You know? um, but I think, yeah, you, you make things that you believe in, that you find funny, that uh, you say things that you think are worth saying, and, um, and people respond because they can see the conviction in you. So even if they haven't had the same experiences, they understand that there's this kind of um, truth to what you're doing, if, if there is, of course. And, um, and I think this, in this way, the sort of vibrancy of your quirks as an artist works in the same way as fantasy. It gives people permission to be themselves, too, because they can see you're being yourself through, through, some, sort of, um, through some sort of character or, or, or whatever it is. Um, you do not need to do art by market research. And finally, um, do I, I mean, this is probably the most important one. Um, I think to do something well, you have to stick with it. And, um, and to stick with it, you have to be completely into it. And you can't do anything well, uh, well unless you're really completely at home with it. Um, I'm a big believer in working as much as you can, if you're doing creative stuff, 
and um, yeah, just, just kind of working as the person you can't help but be, which sometimes means thinking about who you were and what you did before the world told you you had to do a certain kind of thing. So when you were four, <laughs> or even younger, or, or you know, whatever, um, before you started to go down a particular route, what did you do? What kinds of things did you make? Um, when I create these events, whether they're highly fantastical or just regular panel discussions, or I do loads of different kinds of events, um, I really don't think I'm doing anything different to what I did when I was six years old in the playground, just organising people into characters and, and instructing them to perform to a brief or to a vision, I suppose. So it's about thinking about the kind of creative approach you've always had. Uh, who were you before society started telling you to be someone? And I've, I've interviewed dozens of creative people um, and, and the most, in my opinion, the most successful artists in their field will all have a story of doing a version of the thing they do now when they were very young, or, be, or at least certainly before they got uh, steered down a particular path and then probably came back to it. So do what you always did. You've been doing it longer, probably, than you've done anything else. Um, so you're naturally good at it, and you've got a tendency to do it, perhaps a need to do it. I think we're told, to, sort of taught really, to push ourselves out of our comfort zones, and that's fine. But we need the foundations of our personal creative identities too. Um, you were always this person, so of course you can do it. And uh, that, that's all I've got. Thank you very much. That's my website. Thank you. That was fantastic. Very, really inspirational and great messages there for us all to reflect on. So brilliant. Um, so we're now at a tea break. Um, we're going to have tea and coffee for about 20 minutes. Um, and then um, I think we've got Cara Ellenson talking to us. Um, and then our panel machine. So um, yeah, thanks everyone. And another round for um, Leila. Thank you.